Good morning, everyone. We are so blessed that you're with us both in person and online. Over the last six weeks, we have been focusing on the cross, the place where Christ suffered and died on our behalf. Today, we put the cross in the background and we focus on the empty tomb, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today, this Resurrection Sunday falls on the fifth Sunday, which in our congregation means that the youth lead worship. The youth have done a phenomenal job over the last couple years. They have grown so much in their faith. And as I like to remind you, it's far different for them looking out this way than it is for you looking in this way. So we know the Lord will direct and guide each one as they help us to lead worship. And we're just so thankful that everyone is here today as we celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's remember that Christ is the light of our lives, the light of our world, a light that can never be extinguished. May we take this time to center our hearts and minds and take a deep breath as we shut out the world and bring in the light of Christ to remind us of his presence with us.
Wasn't that beautiful? Terry, thank you. That was amazing. What a wonderful way to start our worship service. Would you please stand as we sing Christ Arose? We are going to sing all verses of number 298. Let's sing out today like never before. Let's join our voices together. Good morning. Will you join me in the call to worship? It happened. Jesus was right. Darkness is gone. The light of Christ reigns over our hearts. God's love and forgiveness is in we are forgiven. Christ has freed us from the burdens of sin, doubt, and fear. Will you all pray with me this morning? Loving God, we come to you in celebration of Christ our Lord. He has risen today. Our hopes and dreams have come true. We no longer have to fear death because Jesus took our place and died on the cross to pay for our sins. We praise you, God, for raising Christ from death and giving us new spiritual life. We trust the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to you, God, so we will receive your wondrous words of love and be obedient to you by accepting the many opportunities you give us to serve you by serving others. We praise you for another smooth and successful week out doing your work, and we're forever thankful for the opportunity to come together and worship you, Lord. We pray for this upcoming week to be safe and filled with your joy, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
As for being seated, I would invite all the children to come up and join Gannon for a children's message if they would. Come on down, all the kids. surprise anybody <clears throat> have you guys ever played with one of these no, no. <clears throat> I know when I was your age I love playing with these <clears throat> because um, Jack in the Box always surprised me and sometimes it even scared me like two seconds ago <clears throat> so there's a story in the Bible that we can relate to the Jack in the Box so on the morning, the Sunday morning after Jesus was crucified, there was two women that went to where Jesus was buried. <clears throat> and when they got there, they found that the stone that was covering the tomb had been rolled away and Jesus wasn't there. So they were pretty surprised by that. Just, just how we were surprised by the jack-in-the-box. And then suddenly, two men in dazzling bright clothes came along and appeared to the woman and said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He has risen just as he told you he would. <clears throat> so when the women heard these words, they remembered that Jesus had told them that he would be crucified, but that he would rise again on the third day. So now they were no longer surprised at finding the empty grave. So they rushed back to tell the disciples and everyone else what they had seen. So some surprises, like playing with the jack-in-the-box, make us happy. But the best reason we have to be happy today is that the grave is empty, Jesus is alive, and he loves us very much. And that is what we celebrate on Easter. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we praise you. Jesus has risen, just as he said he would. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And kids, before you take off here, we've got one more thing here, just real quick. After church, meet one of the kids out there, and they will have a snack for us. So they're going to go over what, the, what each part of the snack is really quick. <clears throat> or maybe not. <laughs> just, you want to read them? All right. The pretzel sticks mean, or like symbolize the cross. The craisins symbolize Jesus' blood. The round cracker symbolizes the stone that was rolled away. The goldfish uh, symbolizes the fishers of men. The popcorn symbolizes the sins that are washed away. And the M&Ms taste and see that the Lord is good. Everyone is welcome to the Lord's table. As Teresa announced earlier, to get your communion, to get your uh, wafer and your cups. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds to come to the Lord's table and take the seat he has reserved for each one of us. Yes, Christ has given us this place at the table because he loves us and wants us to be with him always. Let's prepare our hearts as we sing number 292, verses 1 and 3, because he lives.
remember all the meals that you've eaten over the past week. Some meals may have been eaten at home, some at school or work, and still others have been fast food eaten in the car or on the way to go to a game or other activity. Maybe you remember the desserts more than the meals themselves. No matter how much we have enjoyed our meals and desserts over the last week, none of these meals are as meaningful as this meal of communion that Jesus invites us to share with him and each other. We don't remember communion because of the variety of foods served or because of how the bread and juice taste. This communion meal was not given to us to fill our stomachs. Rather, the communion meal Jesus gives us feeds our souls. At this table, we remember how after Jesus celebrated the Passover feast, Jesus took a loaf and after giving thanks, he blessed it. He gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, giving thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Truly, I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Loving God, we ask you to bless this bread to our souls of all who receive it. We eat this bread in remembrance of Jesus' blood that was broken on the cross to pay for our sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy God, we ask you to bless this juice to the souls of all who receive it. We drink from this cup in remembrance of Jesus' blood which was shed on the cross to wash away our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We take this bread together as a way to remember Jesus' body broken for our sins. This cup represents that our sins are forgiven through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. We take this cup to remember that our sins are forgiven. Today's prayer is from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 23. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several disciples were there. Simon, Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathal from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and to other disciples, Simon's, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll have to come too, they all said. So they went out into the boat, but they caught nothing at all. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of God. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had learned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Jesus asked Peter, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if you want me to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that his disciple wouldn't die, but that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Thank you very much. On my very first day of college, I received and learned two distinct and different types and ways to teach. The first happened in a class called Art Appreciation. The teacher came in and sat down very informally on a table. He said, this is the easiest class you'll ever take. Everyone will get an A. He said, I want you to, all you have to do is show up. And the day before the test, I will give you all the answers. If you'll write those down and write them on the paper, you'll get an A. He said, and then after you take that test, I want you to reach back to the back of your head and you will feel a little bump there where your skull connects to your spine. And I want you to push that like a button and you can just dump all the knowledge I've given you out of your mind. It will never be applicable again. Just push that button, get rid of it, and move on. My next class was a whole lot different. It was a business professor. His name was Mr. Kruger. And if any of you like me grew up in the 80s and 90s and remember a movie called Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> this professor had the nickname, lovingly and behind his back, of course, as Freddy, because his classes were literally a nightmare. When he came in, he told you up front that you are to remember and learn everything that he said because one concept would build on another would build on another, would build on another, and that if we missed a concept to see him so he could bring us up to speed. He wanted us to apply everything that we learned to our life. And so when it came time for the test, he simply handed you a sheet of paper with some questions and a packet of paper. And for the next two hours, you would sit there and write everything you could in essay form about what you learned and about the question. He would then take the time to grade every one of those pieces of paper. And he would write in red what you had missed. And he would go over what you did right in a different color. And then he would present these papers back to you and teach you why you had done wrong or what you had gained. And then encourage us to apply that to the next level class which we would take with him. And so I had several classes with him. And when I got out of school with my accounting degree, I thought I'll never need to be a teacher. Little did I know the Lord would later call me into ministry. And so I asked myself, what type of teacher do I want to be? Because James tells us in the third chapter that not many should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. The word of God says those who teach his word, they have a greater responsibility because more is given. So I want to be the type of teacher that gives you the concepts from God's word, helps you learn and grow and apply them, and encourages you to remember that the knowledge that we glean from the Bible will not save us. The knowledge itself will not save us unless we put it in our heart and believe it and then apply it to our life. And so today, let's take just a brief moment to review what we know about God's word. 
he tells us that we are made in his image, that he is God, that he created the world and everything in it, and that he loves us. And we can recognize God in three distinct forms. We have the Father, the creator of everything. We have the Son in human flesh who walked among us and suffered and died in our place. We have the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in our heart and live with us always. So the scriptures go through this in a very succinct way about how time and time again people forgot God. They sinned against him. They lived in their own selfish desires. But God didn't quit loving us because he sent Christ into our life. And Christ, as the Son of God, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus interacting with others. And he goes up to people that the world considered unworthy. And he taught. And he gave in parables so we could learn to think for ourselves. And he would reach out to people and forgive their sins. He would heal their infirmities. He would make the blind to see, the lame to walk, and the deaf to hear. And ultimately, Jesus would gather in the upper room. And he would celebrate the Passover feast in which we shared today, in which Lindley and everyone led us in, where we remember how Jesus, there in that room, celebrated how the Israelites were free from the bondage of sin. And then... He gave us the act of communion to remember that our sins are forgiven. To remember that through his death on the cross and the breaking of his body, his blood flowed to wash away our sins. And we remember today how Christ prophesied this and then suffered and died in our place. How his body was placed in the tomb, but today we have the empty tomb. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the promise that through our faith in him, we are free from the burden of sin, and our souls will live forever in the kingdom of heaven. And as a guarantee, God has sent his Holy Spirit, that little voice in our heart and our mind that encourages us and strengthens us and at times challenges us, gives us courage and wisdom that comes to dwell in all who believe in their heart. And confess in their mouth that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, the Messiah of the world. So that is the foundation of faith upon which we live. And we've all heard the Easter story many times. Gannon shared it with us today. How when Mary showed up at the tomb, it was empty and she was surprised. And how she saw Jesus there. And how Jesus told her to go and prepare his disciples and tell them what was happening that he had indeed risen again. So we have this truth in our life. Christ, the Son of God, died in our place, rose from the tomb, give us the promise of eternity. So through faith, we can live forever with God. And so now, how do we apply that to our lives? Well, to learn that, we go back to Peter and the story that Damien and Hallie shared with us today, the scriptures Peter was a fisherman who came to follow Jesus. Peter was the first one to declare that Jesus was the Messiah. Peter was the one who, as Christ was being arrested, said, I will stand with you to the death, only to turn and deny Jesus three times. To turn and deny him three times before the rooster crowed. And so we know that they stood back and watched Jesus die. And they met him in a resurrected form. And we know now that Peter, Peter didn't know what to do with himself after he didn't see Christ resurrected again. So what do most of us do when we don't know what to do? We go back to what we used to do. We go back to what's comfortable, to what's familiar. And so Peter, sitting there with the disciples, says to them, I'm going fishing. And so for the first time in three plus years, he gets back on the boat. And they go out and they fish all night and they catch nothing. They're coming close to the shore as the sun is rising. And they see this figure there who says, have you caught anything? No, we haven't. Well, cast your net off the right-hand side of the boat. And when they cast that net, they pulled it up 
And it was so full that they couldn't get it in the boat. And so at that moment, the disciple John turns to Peter and he thinks to himself, this happened once before. We saw this happen when Jesus called us to follow him. I've seen this. That's Jesus. In our life, we can look at situations in our life and look back and say, that was Jesus. We didn't recognize him at the time, but that was him providing for us. So as soon as the disciple John said that, Peter said, it's the Lord. And he put on his robe and he waded out in the water and he went to Jesus. And he found Jesus there, charcoal fires, fish prepared, bread ready for a bread breakfast. And he tells Peter, go and bring some more fish. We need some of your fish. We need you to, con to contribute to this. And so Peter, Peter went out and drug the net in, and, and there was 153 large fish. But we don't focus on the number today. We focus on the fact that they shared some of their catch, and they had breakfast with Jesus. And it's so important that we realize that Jesus ate with them indicating his physical body was fully resurrected, that he had risen from the dead. And then after breakfast, they're there. And I wonder what Peter thought, because he's the one who had declared Jesus to be the Messiah. He's the one in whom Jesus had said, I'm going to change your name to Peter, and you're going to be the rock upon which I build my church. Not a physical structure, the body of Christ, the people and this church that you build, the gates of hell, will never overcome it. And now Peter finds himself face to face with his Messiah after denying him three times. So I wonder what Peter was thinking. But Jesus doesn't look to Peter and hold him to his failures. He doesn't ask him about what happened. He doesn't bring up all that transpired. Instead, he looks to Peter. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than boats? Do you love me more than this world? Do you love me more than your friends? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And now Jesus gives him something to do. Feed my lambs. And this is a statement back to remind us that we're the sheep of God's pasture and our children are lambs. Go and feed the lambs. Feed them not only their physical body, but feed their little souls with the word of God. Teach them about Jesus and plant in them early the seeds of the gospel. And so that has become our charge as the church. Feed the lambs. Go to the lambs while they're innocent and young and teach them the word of God. So what are we doing today in our service when our youth lead us? We're feeding our lambs. We're watching as they demonstrate these great qualities of sharing the love of God. And as Jesus said, a little child will lead them. So now Peter thinks he's got it all figured out. Maybe he's going to go feed the lambs. But Jesus asked him again. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. A sheep would be an adult. And notice he says, take care of them. What does it mean to take care of somebody? Well, I think first and foremost, it means to show them love and compassion. To show them grace. And we do that by remembering how Jesus loves us. And sometimes the greatest gift we can give somebody is to listen to what they're going through. Not trying to fix them. Not trying to change them. Not trying to control their life or their situation. Rather, we come alongside and we say, how can we help? How can we help? How can we show you love? And when we do that, we are then feeding the sheep. Because so many sheep, myself included, have been wounded by sin, by disappointment, by other people. And so to have a loving congregation come alongside of you and love you as you are, 
without judgment, without criticism, to accept your gifts that you're offering, that's taking care of the sheep. And as we take care of sheep, we know that they will want to know more about Jesus. So now Peter is saying, okay, I'm supposed to feed the lambs, so to take care of the sheep. But then Jesus says to them, Peter, do you love me? And now Peter's feelings are hurt. Three times Jesus has asked him. Three times Jesus has said, do you love me? So he answers again, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. You know that I love you. And now Jesus says, feed my sheep. Once you take care of a sheep, once you meet their immediate needs to be loved and to have compassion and to be forgiven, then you can begin to feed them with the word of God. Peter tells us that we are to be equipped and ready at any given moment to tell our hope of salvation, to tell our hope and our relationship with Jesus. But when we tell that, we are to tell it in a humble and gentle and kind way. That's how we feed the sheep. So now we see Jesus charging Peter, the rock of the church, and charging us today. That it's our responsibility as to believers to come together and form an environment in which the lambs are first and foremost protected and fed. And then we're to welcome in everyone, all of the sheep. We're to show them compassion and love and forgiveness so that when they're ready, they can then hear the word of God. They can hear the word of God and we can feed them on the word of God. That's our responsibility. That's what we're charged to do by our Lord. And so now Peter has learned and he's shown us how to apply what we learn from Jesus. We love as Jesus loves us. We take care of the young children. We take care of the adults. We share when we're ready, when they're ready to hear about Jesus. And now he says to Peter, he says, when you were young, you got to go wherever you wanted. He said, but I'm telling you that a time is coming when you'll be old and you'll stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus was telling Peter that because of your faith, you'll die as I died. You'll be crucified. For your faith. And so Peter is hearing this, and Jesus is trying to prepare him so that he will stand firm in his faith all the way to the end of his life here on earth. And so this, his death would glorify God. And Jesus says, Now come and follow me. Notice Jesus doesn't say, Run ahead and prepare the way. He says, Don't get ahead of me, follow me. Stay where I am. Don't run ahead. The Lord taught me this lesson through a small 15-pound dog. I used to go walking without a leash. Yes, I was breaking the law. And the dog would run ahead. And when she got so far ahead, she would turn around to see if I was still there. And if I wasn't, she would run back, look for me, get back behind me, go a little ways farther, and then run out ahead again. But if she looked back and saw me, she just kept going. And I thought, how often in life do we start out following Jesus? But then we try to take matters into our own hands and run ahead. Try to control the situation. Try to prepare the way. But Jesus reminds us, as he reminded Peter, follow. Follow me. Be a servant to all. Spend time in prayer and the word and listen. Then follow what Jesus says. And so now Peter knows his charge. And now he looks around and he sees John. What do we do when we see somebody else? We compare. We wonder what's going to happen in their life. And so when we're busy watching other people, we're not paying attention to our own journey. When we're busy picking the splinters out of someone else's eye, we can't see the log in our own. And so Peter is looking over there at John, and, and he says to Jesus, he leans over, and, and he says, What about him, Lord? 
What are you going to do to him? How's he going to die? What's going to happen in his life? And Jesus does not even entertain his question with an answer. He simply says, if I want him to live until I return, what's that to you? As for you, follow me. I take this advice to heart in my life when I get that tendency to compare. Has anybody else ever found themselves tempted to compare their life to somebody else's? And when you compare to someone else's life, you're losing the joy and the contentment that God has given you. Our contentment is found in following Jesus, following him and doing what he asks. And so I love Jesus' response. What's that to you? I ask myself that sometimes when I start criticizing and judging others. What's that to you? Jesus is working in their life. Instead of criticizing them, why don't you look at the, look at the perspective of they're a child of God too? That Jesus suffered and died on their behalf. And that they've got their own burdens that they're trying to work through. And they don't need your judgment on top of it. They need you to come alongside and love them and encourage them and feed them. And so Peter's looking there and he's hearing Jesus say, what's that to you? As for you, follow me. And everybody around is saying, well, Jesus said that he's going to live forever. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So may we, on this resurrection day, with our faith renewed in the open tomb, may we begin to formulate within us how we will apply the gospel, how we will live the gospel. Because in the end, each one of us will come before the Lord and he will ask us to give an account for our time, our treasure, for our talent, for our testimony. And we'll give an account to him, the giver of all things. So it's important that we are aware and intentionally ask ourselves, how will I live? How will I apply the gospel? Will I take Jesus at his word and love and feed the children? Protect them and take care of them? Will I take Jesus at his word and come alongside and meet people where they are? Not trying to fix them. Not trying to control them. Just walking with them. Showing them love and compassion and forgiveness. And if I do that, will I be ready when that person asks me about my hope in Jesus? And will I be ready to share it with them in a humble and gentle and kind manner? And will I do that with contentment in my heart that Jesus has a plan for my life that is my life? He has a plan for you that is your life. And it's not up to me to decide what Jesus does in your life. It's not up to you to decide what Jesus is doing in the life of someone else. He said, as for you, follow me. And if we will apply this to our life every day, we will not live a perfect life, but we'll live a life filled with peace and joy and grace and the assurance of God's forgiveness. But if you're like me, once you make a mistake, you tend to beat yourself up for that mistake over and over and over again. On this Resurrection Sunday, I would ask that you look to the Lord and accept his forgiveness. Accept that he has forgiven you. That through his blood on the cross, our sins are washed away and God remembers our sin no more. He wants us to use the lessons that we've learned and not do it again. That's repentance. Take the lesson that you've learned. Don't do it again. Apply it to your life. And if we do that, we will find that we live in that peace and joy with God. And every day, he'll renew our hearts and our thoughts and our minds. And every day, we'll think less about our selfish desires. And we'll think more about Jesus. And when we think more about Jesus, we act more like Jesus. So Jesus tells us the greatest commandments that we have. Love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and love 
each other as Jesus loves us. How has Jesus loved you? How has Jesus loved you in your life? How has he provided for you? When you formulate those answers, you can then apply them to your life. And you can treat others in that same way. So on this day when we remember Christ's resurrection, let's look into our heart. Let's lay down those burdens and those times we've beaten ourselves up. Let's accept the love and the forgiveness of Christ. We will accept, if we will accept that, he'll renew our hearts, he'll renew our minds, and we'll be a transformed person in Christ. And as a transformed person, we will have the assurance that when our earthly tent is taken down, that is when our spirit leaves this earthly body, that we'll have a home in heaven, a place prepared for us by Jesus himself, and not by human hands. That is our promise. May we lay down our burdens and rejoice in what our Savior has given us as we receive this gift of special music from David. at the wall the gates began to rattle and a voice began to call I hurried to the window and looked down into the street expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers feet but there was no one there but Mary so I went down to let her in John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been She said they moved him in the night And none of us knows where The stone's been rolled away And now his body isn't there So we both ran toward the garden And John ran on ahead We found the stone and the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said But the winding sheet they wrapped him in Was just an empty shell and how and where they'd taken him was more than I could tell. Well, some strange thing had happened there, but just what I didn't know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. Cause I'd seen them crucify him. And then I saw him die Back inside the house again The guilt and anguish came Everything I promised him Just added to my shame When at last it came to choices I denied I knew his name And even if he were alive 
it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly, the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. Light that came from everywhere filled the shadows from the room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. And I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried. And then he raised me to my feet, and as I looked into his eyes, a love was shining out from them like sunlight from the skies. Guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet relief. And every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace. He's alive, he's alive, oh he's alive and I'm forgiven, heaven's gates are open wide, he's alive, hallelujah, he's alive, oh he's alive and I'm so much. Thank you so much. We can go ahead and be seated. Will you will you play with me? Heavenly Father, today as we celebrate the resurrection of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask that the light of your love will flood into our souls, filling us with your healing and loving presence as we, as we praise you for the hope we have through the assurance that our sins are forgiven, just as the woman at Jesus' tomb was surprised that the stone had been rolled away and that Jesus was alive. We are still surprised by the many ways you work in our lives to reveal the good news of salvation that we receive through our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. Christ is risen and will always with Jesus, with Christ to a new life and of hope and love we let we let the joy of good news swirl around in our hearts and burst forth from us through the words and actions you have given each of us different gifts and abilities so that we can work together under your leadership to form the church, also called the body of Christ. As we gather in faith, we unite our voices and pray together as Jesus taught us by singing. Our Father, you art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom kingdom will be done on this in heaven. Give us to stay our daily bread and forgive us our sins. And you forgive us, sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. That is the kingdom and power and the glory. Amen. Wasn't that amazing? Ooh, here, I'll just stand up. <laughs> I like this. 
All right, if you would please stand, we're going to sing Christ the Lord is Risen today. If you love to sing, if I've mentioned this to you ahead of time, come on up. This is an impromptu choir. We've never done this together. We never practiced. We're going to stand up here. We will sing number 298, verses 1, 2, 3. And if you feel the Lord calling you to come to him through confession of faith and baptism, or you're part of our congregation, we invite you to do so as they join us in, as they lead us in song. sound wonderful. And now I would invite Ella to come down and share with us the benediction. Christ is risen. He goes before us into this world of fear and pain. He sends us in the world to share the good news of his healing and hope. Go into peace and feel the presence of the risen Lord with you, now and forever. Amen. Amen.